But go, go ahead and get to uh, Proverbs 3. Um, tonight, I, I felt uh, led that it was a good opportunity to go through one of my favorite Old Testament Bible characters and uh, kind of talk about the example that he gives us. Does anyone know who my favorite Old Testament Bible character is? Jeremy Holland. Joseph is the correct answer. Joseph, the story of Joseph, I find just absolutely, uh, you know, riveting. I, I can read these passages over and over again. And, uh, you know, when we, we talk about Joseph, what I see here is he is an amazing man full of patience, integrity, and character, no matter what happens. And, and you know, when you read that story, and, and I've read it over and over again, and I marvel at how the way the story ends, right? We all marvel at how the way the story ends because Joseph got his because that's how we look at things, right? And, and, you know, so God brought justice and he brought blessing to him even though the people were being unfair to him. But that's not what's amazing about the story. What's amazing about the story is Joseph never lost his focus. And what was his focus through that entire thing? It was on God. It was just, I, I mean, laser focused. You know, whether, whether he thought he was going to die, whether, you know, he was being sold, whether he, you know, I, he never lost his focus. But we always look at the end of that story and think, yeah, Joseph, yeah, he's a hero. He's a hero because he never lost his focus. Um, you know, when we look at, look at his actions, it is a shining example of one of God's most loyal servants that we could possibly look at as an example. Um, you know, God saw him worthy um, to be promoted many times, right? He, he got promoted many times. Uh, you know, who, who here doesn't think, you know, man, wouldn't it be nice to get promoted at work? You know, I, I, I may be plugging for a promotion at work right now myself because I think, hey, you know what? I, I deserve it. You know, Joseph never plugged for a promotion. It just happened because he kept his laser focus on God. Uh, you know, when we have times in our lives where we're being treated unfairly, or, uh, you know, things just aren't going the way we think they should, we need to have our focus, right? Keep our eyes on God continually through all of that. Um, you know, live in integrity, have confidence that God's going to take care of it. And, you know, I think I talked just a little bit a few weeks ago there about how easy it is to get fearful of things, right? To get scared. And why do we feel that way? If we have our faith and our confidence and our hope in God, kind of like the song we had, right, that, that we just finished uh, learning. Um, and you did fine, Ryan. You, you, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> you, uh, you know, that having our hope in him and letting things happen in God's perfect timing and not our, our desires and our timing. Um, so hold your place in Proverbs 3, please. Uh, but I would like you to go to Genesis uh, chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Now in Genesis 37, uh, in verses 23 through 28, we see where Joseph went from being the favorite son to a slave. But if we back it up to verse 3, so in, verse, in chapter 37, verse 3, it says, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and made him a coat of many colors. Now, first thing I'm going to say is, you know, come on, let, let's all be honest here, parents. We all have our favorites, right? <laughs> Neither one of my kids are in the room, so uh, um, it, it, my favorite's the dog, actually. Let's be honest. I love that dog. Um, you know, I, I look at this passage and I'm like, Israel, I, I mean, he set his boy up, didn't he? How many brothers did this guy have? And Israel just dotes on Joseph and gives him the, this coat and does all these things. And what does it make his brothers do? It makes him hate him. You know, how awful of a setup could that possibly be as a parent to do that to one of your children? You know, it's not his intention. Because Joseph was his favorite. But here in verse 3, we clearly see Joseph was his favorite. And then in verse 23, 
we see where that, uh, that turns sour for Joseph. Uh, in verse 23, And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And I, I love how the, you know, the, in the Bible here, it says they stripped him out of his coat, and then it reminds us that this is a special coat, right? It's the coat of many colors. And uh, in verse 24, They took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us uh, sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he, he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. So think about, I mean, I know how I would react to that. I, I would, you know, the, the devastating thought of my, you know, I have three brothers. I can still take them, but, you know. If they were to do something like this to me, I, I, you know, I, I, how devastating would that be? And yet, as we go through this passage, where does Joseph keep his focus? Where does Joseph keep his eyes the whole time? All right? So, you know, the key to the greatness of, of Joseph was, was the pain that he dealt with. All right? And he deals with this several times in, in the passages here. All right? So he goes into slavery. And next thing you know, things turn out pretty good for him in slavery, don't they? Uh, in verse 39, in verse, uh, chapter 39, I apologize. In verse 2, I do want to, to make sure we understand here that in verse 2 it says, And the Lord was with Joseph. And we go into verse 3, And his new master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he, he did uh, to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. Quick turnaround here for Joseph, right? He's continued his focus on God. He's been sold into slavery, but now he's the top slave. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's the boss. He, he controls everything of his, his new uh, rich owner's land, everything he has, Joseph has control of. Right? He is the head of the household. But when we get to, uh, to verse 11, things change again for Joseph. Right? He, he goes from being the head of the household to what? To a prisoner. Right? And, you know, don't want to dig too much into the story. Potiphar's wife was a mean lady. You know, she liked Joseph. Joseph was a good man of God, didn't like her back. And now he's in prison. All right? Um, but in chapter 39, and we'll see a couple more times here, it says four different times that the Lord was with Joseph. The next one is in verse 21. All right? This is after he is in prison. And in verse 21, it says the Lord was with Joseph. All right? And in verse 22, the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. Well, now he's the head prisoner. You know, he's, he's back on top. Um, and, uh, you know, in verse 23, it says one more time, you know, the reason that he is prospering in prison is because the Lord was with him. Um, you know, and then in his time in prison, as we get into uh, um, verses uh, or chapter 40, it talks about the butler and the baker, right? And they come and they have the dreams, and Joseph is their shoulder to cry on. And, you know, he interprets their dreams, and what he interpreted came true. And, uh, you know, there was a promise made to Joseph after he interpreted those dreams. And that promise that was made to him eh, kind of fell by the wayside, didn't it? But you know what? In the two years or, or whatever it was from the time that Joseph interpreted the dream and said, hey, remember me, and kind of got forgotten... He did not at any time in that two years try and push his own agenda. He continued following God, doing what he was supposed to do. 
You know, how would you feel if somebody made a promise to you that you think probably is going to get you out of prison and it doesn't happen for two years? You know, man, I'm going to be banging my cup on the bar saying, hey, hey, get that guy over here. He said, that's how I would react to that because I wouldn't have the patience uh, to, to just sit back and let God um, take care of it. So, you know, he didn't push his own agenda, but think about times when you have tried to push your own agenda just because, you know, you don't have the patience uh, to, to wait. So, you know, in the time, Joseph, he just keeps doing his thing in the prison. And uh, finally, you know, he gets out of the prison. And as the story goes, he becomes the number two person in Egypt. So he went from favorite son to slave to, you know, head of the household, then to prisoner, then to chief prisoner. Um, and then, you know, he gets out uh, all, all the, the great things, the examples that he, he did. Um, Pharaoh made him number two, the keeper of all the things in Egypt. And then as we know, Joseph gets his because here are his brothers in front of him one day doing what? begging for help, right? The famine, they need food, they need these, these things. And uh, I'm pretty sure I'd have kicked them. But what did Joseph do when he saw his brothers in front of them? He could have had, any, he could have had them killed. He could have absolutely did anything. All right? Now, you know, there was a little bit of gamesmanship there with the, the, the uh, thing being hidden in the bag and, and all that stuff. But, you know, he could have had them killed. He could have literally got his revenge or his perceived justice. But throughout this entire story, he just had the faith and the confidence and the patience to let God and God's justice and his entire family benefited for it. You know, so, so think about that. All right. So, you know, I think you can go ahead and turn to Proverbs 3 now. Um, you know, so I think what we're actually going to talk about here is just the, you know, seven things that you can do to lean on the Lord. And I think, you know, through the story of Joseph, we saw examples of all seven of these things, you know, but I'm sure at some point in your life, you've been told as a Christian to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Matter of fact, you may have said that to someone, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Okay. Think about the, the commitment the patience, the integrity that that takes to truly trust in the Lord with all your heart, right? I mean, just we live on faith just to even be Christians, right? We have to believe in something that we can't see, right? And then to continue to put all of our trust in him, to trust in the Lord with all your heart. So when we talk about the seven things, um, the, the seven steps, I guess, to, to leaning on the Lord, uh, number one is don't depend on you. It is too easy, it is too often too easy to depend on ourselves. You know, I, I feel like I, I've said more than once, I've got this. And no matter what the situation is, should that ever be my response? My response should be the Lord's got this. And I should have that, the faith in him that, that he's going to do that. Um, so, you know, I think when we talk about depending on ourselves, we, we kind of live in a world where we feel like trust has to be earned, doesn't it? You know, and to put all of your faith and trust in God, well, there's, you know, there's nothing about earning that, right? God doesn't need to earn our trust. You know, I, our, our saying at work is verify, then trust, you know, make, make sure it's done and then trust that they did it. Um, you know, so that becomes very, very easy to be skeptical and, and things. Um, but uh, in Proverbs 3 and verse 5, it simply says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Pretty simple and straightforward, isn't it? I, I don't, I, there, there's no way around this. It doesn't say to, uh, to trust in yourself. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not under your own understanding. You know, think about disappointments that you faced. 
uh, you know, and, and how it's just very easy to, to feel sorry for yourself or to, you know, again, got to pull up, pull up our bootstraps and, and make things better. You know, that's not our job. That's not our role. You know, um, living the life uh, that God has called us to live means we need to unlearn that lesson, right? It's not about us pulling up our bootstraps. It's not about us getting tough, right? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. You know, when the going gets tough, turn to God. You know, put all of your faith, all of your trust in him. Um, rest in God's understanding. Uh, in Romans, it talks about, uh, in chapter 11, it talks about uh, the, 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 the depth of the riches and wisdom, right? And the knowledge of God. And uh, how there is, you know, th- there's no questioning God's wisdom and knowledge. You know, when you look at it that way, well, who else should you have your trust in than, than somebody who is all-knowing and, and all-powerful, all right? So, you know, what if we, you know, what if we struggle with putting our trust in him? You know, how do we, how do we overcome that? And that's where step two comes in, all right? Step two is simply cry out to God. Cry out to God. Um, in Proverbs Three and verse six, it says, "In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths." Um, you know, by calling out to him, by crying out to him, we are telling him that we can't do it and we need him. Um, you know, when we pray, you know, and when we ask for God to answer prayers and, and we ask for those things, we are we are admitting that he is the higher power. You know, we are yielding ourselves to him. Um, you know, so when, when you think about the Bible verse that says pray without ceasing, you know, if you could truly live a life where you are constantly in prayer, all right, you are constantly crying out to God, well, it becomes very, very easy, um, you know, to turn our, uh, our trust uh, to him and not into our, our own abilities. Um, you know, and we're promised when we, when we call out to God, he hears us, right? Doesn't say he's going to give us what we want, but there is a promise that when we cry out to God, he's going to hear us. Um, Psalm 55, verse 17 says, Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Um, you know, so being in a prayerful state of mind, you know, we've handed over the keys to our lives to God. And, and hopefully that allows us or allows us to, to give him the ability to, to lead us, all right? But for that to work, we need to look at number three. Step number three is run from evil. And in today's world, with the Internet and all of the, the things that we have at our disposal, it is very, very hard to get away from what's evil in the world. Um. You know, I, I think it's very hard to be in a prayerful state of mind when you're involved in things of the world. You know, so we have to we have to get away from from that evil. So you know, get away from the clutter of the world that can get into our relate or get in the way of our relationship with God. You know, um, John uh, talked about uh, desires of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of pride in pride in our lives. Um, you know, things that could be stumbling blocks and keep us from seeing the blessings of just living a life that is, that is pure and, and trusting in God. Um, but uh, life works best when we remember that the true source of our blessings is God. And uh, we focus on things that please Him. And Proverbs 3, 7, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7 says, Be not wise in thine own eyes, Fear the Lord and depart from evil. So again, another pretty straightforward statement. By the way, I love the, the, the Proverbs. I try and read through the book of Proverbs. My, my goal is anytime there's a month with 31 days in it, I read a proverb every day. I, I think that that's been a, a good structure for me, and it's just, it's just good to go through the Proverbs and, and read them. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. Um, 
But, you know, the only way we can truly live the life that God wants is for us to separate ourselves from all the bad influences, the, the things that are in our lives. Um, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But it's, it's not easy, right? Think about it. It's not easy. We, we still find ourselves giving in to the desires of our flesh. You know, we still find ourselves trying to do things, you know, our way. I did it my way. Yeah, I'm not really going to sing. That would be, that would be bad. Um, you know, uh, but if we spend time with him, again, if we are in that prayerful state of mind, it becomes so much easier uh, to not to not give in to the evil desires of our youth and our flesh. All right, so we want to we wanna shun evil. In Proverbs 3 and verse 8, it says, This will bring health. I'm sorry. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. So it says, This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. We all want to be healthy, don't we? We all want to be nourished. Man, speaking of nourished, we went to La Rosa's today. Whew. Spaghetti and meatballs. Jeremy, I, Jeremy was there, and I was afraid he was going to make fun of me if I didn't clean my plate, so I did, and I'm paying for it still, even now, hours later. Garlic bread, and whew, it was good. To, who doesn't love La Rosa's? Come on. <laughs> um, all right, but, but we want that health, and we want that nourishment to our bones. Um, so, you know, when we pursue him, we find the abundant life that we're looking for. Um, but again, it doesn't come natural to us. We, we are fleshly beings, so that doesn't come natural to us. You know, it means that we need to make a serious change, and that's number four, which is put God first in your life. It's so easy to, uh, to put ourselves first. You know, even though we, as kids you learn the joy principle, right? Jesus first, others second, yourself last, or third, or last. You know, I, I think it becomes very, very hard when, especially when things get tough. You know, when things are going well, eh, it's easy. You know, it, it's easy to, to put others ahead of you. It's easy to, to think about Jesus. But, you know, when things go bad, we kind of go, hey, why am I being forsaken? You know, it's very, very easy to do that. Um, so, you know, the, the other thing that, that happens is, you know, if, if something good happens, we tend to want to congratulate ourselves or, you know, you ever throw your shoulder out, pat yourself on the back? Man, I hate when that happens. I hate that shoulder. Get to get that shoulder looked at. Um, you know, or something bad happens and we want to console ourselves. Oh, you know, I just, I, I, I'm going to go back to bed and just cry. Um, you know, we, we have... Uh, we often have a me, me-centric, me-centric starting place for, for our view of how we look at things. You know, um, I think, too, you know, we, we, we all want to have nice things, and so we all want to make money, all right? And when it comes to that money, the struggle's even harder, all right? But Solomon, who, uh, who was doing a, a little bit of Bible writing here, um, and, by the way, had a bit of money himself, right? You know, Solomon had a little bit of money. Um, you know, he knew that that money didn't belong to him. All right? So, you know, putting God first in your life, in my opinion, absolutely starts with making sure that you give of your excess and you give your first fruits to God, right? And so in Proverbs 3 and verses 9 through 10... Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. You want to you have a full barn? You want to have plenty of wine? Give to God. Because it's his. Right? Put your focus on him. All right? So if we can trust God first with our, you know, with, with our wealth, um, you know, we're showing how much we depend on him. You know, again, it, handing over that first part of your paycheck, it takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of trust to do that, you know. Um, but it means that we are no longer being me-centric. We're being God-centric. Um, 
But, you know, you, you, you've got to make sure that you have checks and balances in place, and so that is number five. And number five is check yourself by God's word. You thought I was going to say check yourself before you wreck yourself, didn't you? <laughs> check yourself by God's word. Because when Mike Graver sits back and evaluates Mike Graver, what's Mike Graver do? Two thumbs up, Mike Graver. You're doing a great job. If I evaluate myself by my standards, I'm like, yeah, here we go again. Look at me. Um, all right, I'm going to do the Tom Knox thing. When I'm pointing at you, i got all these fingers pointing back at me. Just had to throw that in there. Um, you know, so let's be honest, right? We can't evaluate ourselves because we're going to evaluate ourselves by the wrong standards, you know. Um, and, and we'll find excuses for our behaviors, for our actions, for our sins. Um, you know, we, we, we don't need a defense attorney. We can find pretty much, you know, a, a good reason for any of the bad things that we've done or any of the bad things that, that happen. All right. But Jeremiah, uh, in chapter 17, mentions that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? All right. It wasn't talking about God's heart. It's talking about the heart of men, you know, talking about our hearts. <clears throat> So if we're going to truly trust in God and we're truly going to flee evil, you know, we got to know where we stand. And where do we find our objective measure? All right, this is, this is the comparison, you know. When Mike Graver compares himself to Mike Graver, he's doing all right. When Mike Graver compares himself to a Joseph, yeah, I am lacking, uh, woefully lacking. And I think we would all agree in, in those same things, all right? Now, that doesn't always mean that we're going to like what we see, but in Proverbs uh, 3 and verse 11, it says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary in his correction. All right? Correction's a good thing. I, I've learned some hard lessons in life and, you know, managing people at work and, and those things. You know, I kind of talked about the, uh, the radical candor thing at our men's breakfast and, and how important that is, because if you care, you are going to challenge the people that report to you to do their best, right, on the behalf of themselves and the business. Um, you know, so correction isn't always the, a bad thing, you know. You know, you think of a, of a small child and they get corrected or they get spanked or whatever it is, right? It's the worst thing that's ever happened to them, but that's not truly the, the case. It is a fantastic opportunity to right your ship, to turn things around, to get your focus back where it needs to be. Um, you know, we, we can know where, exactly where we stand, all right? <clears throat> um, you know, it's an opportunity to, to see the bad things or to see ourselves in the bad light and admit that we need to change. And, you know, so talked about, you know, the, the crying out to God to keep us where we need to be. Well, the other part is checking ourselves according to his word. Um, spending that time in the Bible um, is a great place. And, and uh, you know, Psalm 119, 11 talks about hiding God's word in your heart. All right. Why? Why should we hide God's word in our heart? So that we might not sin against him. You know, that, that should be our goal ultimately, right? Now, again, we've discussed how hard that can be. Um, and so when we have Scripture planted in our hearts, that's a good thing, and God's going to use that to deal with us. And he's going to use that to deal with us in number six, which is listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. All right? You know, I, I, I was reading a thing. I, it was one of my Bible studies recently, and it, it talked about... Um, the Holy Spirit being our GPS, our spiritual GPS. Yeah. Everybody here know how to use a GPS? Get you where you go? Uh, some of you maybe still want to pull out the atlas. Can you even buy an atlas anymore? I, I, you know, I, I can remember going on trips with my dad, and we had that atlas. And, you know, but I learned a lot because when we were traveling, we'd pull out that atlas, and we'd you know, run your finger on the map. This is where we're going and all those things, and you don't get that anymore. Now you just get British voices telling you when to turn and when to turn around, uh, you know. But the Holy Spirit is our spiritual GPS. Um, in John 14, it talks about the, the Holy Spirit 
um, whom the Father sends to us is going to teach us and remind us of all the things that we need to do. Um, you know, as we go through our day, and this is just in our day to day, right? This isn't just the big decisions. This is literally uh, day to day. The Holy Spirit guides us through everything we do if we are listening to Him. Um, so we're not alone, right? We're, we're not alone. God has has His Spirit with us at all the time. Um, so we don't have to go it alone. We don't have to hope that we're getting it right. We, we have everything we need. You know, the Holy Spirit can lead us into the truth, the truth of us keeping our focus on God, and can protect us too. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit um, is the one that, you know, if we're listening to him again, um, to, as believers, he can remind us of number seven, all right, the final one, number seven, which is rest in God's love. Anybody here like to rest? Who got a nap today? Yeah, I, I knew Carol did. Carol, Carol, she gets her naps when she wants them. <laughs> I didn't get a nap today, and I am tired. But, uh, you know, we can rest in God's love. What better place to be as a child of God, all right? You know, th think about, you know, think about children and, and where they want to be, right? They want to be resting in their parents' love. Well, we can rest in God's love. You know, we, we have difficult things we have to face. We live in a difficult world. And it can be easy to, to even wonder if God cares. Um, you know, bad things happen to us, right? Bad things happen to good people. Um, you know, where is God when I need him? You know, why do those bad things happen? Uh, in Proverbs 3.12, we get a reminder that God never takes a break. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. You know, even in the midst of the worst things that are happening, happening to us, where is God? He's right there beside us. We're just not paying attention. You know, um, so God sticks with us. You know, he... The bad things are challenges for us to do what? To improve. You know, you, you think about the, the, the story of the potter, right, and forming the clay. Clay goes through some mean stuff to get turned into something, right? And, and that is exactly what those setbacks and those failures are. Um, you know, that's the moments when God is putting the most into us, All right? Those are our opportunities to show, that, to show a world that we trust in God. Um, you know, we can trust in the Lord with all our hearts. He cares for us each and every day. He gives us what we need to thrive um, if we are focusing on him. Now, following these steps isn't easy. Uh, you know, Jesus says that we have to deny ourselves. We have to follow him. That's in Matthew uh, 16. He talks about, you know, deny yourself, follow him. Well, you know, I, I kind of like myself. I don't want to, you know. we got to get out of that. We've got to turn our focus to him. You know, trusting God is a wholehearted commitment, right? It starts with being in the word. It starts with being in a prayerful spirit. Um, because God is always with us. He's always there for us. Um, so I think I turn it back to Joseph. Where in any of those passages about Joseph did you ever see him say, why me, God? It's not mentioned. I think there's a reason it's not mentioned, because I don't think it happened. You know, you know he got thrown into a pit. Man, I'd, I'd be like, well, come on, man, what's up? You know, I, 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 the way that, you know, I picture this, he just right, he sat in a pit until they pulled him out of it, you know? I don't think he screamed, this isn't fair. I don't think, you know, I think he had trust and faith in God. And then he got sold into slavery. And, you know, he didn't protest that. Uh, you know, the only thing he did protest was Potiphar's wife. And, you know, that was the right thing to protest, right? So, you know, I, I think when, you know, I just look at him as that example of those seven things. You want to talk about somebody that rested in God's love? It was Joseph. And, uh, you know, so I appreciate the uh, the the great examples that we have in the Bible and, and the things that we have. And, you know, 
I just appreciate the opportunity to, to be here tonight and just kind of go through some thoughts and some things. So uh, with that, we will close in a word of prayer. Our Lord and our Father, we're thankful for this night, Lord, and we just pray uh, now that you will give each and every one of us safety as we leave here, go to our destinations, Lord. We just pray that you will uh, give us all grace and, and uh, <clears throat> insight, Lord. We pray that you will keep us in a prayerful mindset, Lord, so that we uh, turn our focus to you, whether things are good, whether things are bad, Lord. I just pray that each and every one of us will, will turn to the Bible and dwell on the, the words in, in the Bible, Lord, and that we will listen to the Holy Spirit as he leads I just pray, Lord, that when things are bad for us, that we will turn to you, that we will turn the bad things into positives for you, Lord, as you intended them. We just pray now, Lord, for the many prayer requests that, that we do have. We have many that are sick and ailing, Lord. We just pray that you will do your will in those situations. And, you know, uh, if your will be to, to bring them back to health, Lord, we'd love to see them uh, back here in your house. We just pray now, Lord, again, for uh, everything that we have uh, coming up this week. Uh, we do pray for the pastor as he is away. Lord, just give him traveling mercies as well. Uh, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.